Dr. Murray, could you please tell us what is the conventional wisdom on power transitions among rising and declining powers in international relations, and how does your book challenge that conventional wisdom? Great, thank you, Steve. Um, so the conventional wisdom on power transitions in international relations is twofold. The first is that they are intrinsically destabilizing to the international order. Um, put simply, power transitions usually end in war. The second is that the primary cause of this conflict during a power transition is differential rates of growth among the great powers. Um, that is, power transitions are principally a material phenomenon, right? It's the growing material power of one state and the declining material power of another that sets the stage for conflict. The logic here is pretty straightforward, right? As a rising power gets more powerful, it wants influence in the system that's commensurate with that power. At the very same time, the established power fears that rising power's growth and tries to contain that power. It's those incompatible preferences, right? The, the established power's desire to keep things as they are, the rising power's desire to change them that leads to conflict. Um, and I should say there's something very appealing about this argument, right? It captures something that seems right about power transitions. Throughout history, rising powers have traditionally been revisionist powers, right? They engage in aggressive expansionist foreign policies. So it, it captures something about that. But in my book, I argue against both of those points. In the first instance, I say that not all power transitions, I make the observation, right, simply that not all power transitions do end in war. We have examples, depending on how you count, throughout history of rising powers being able to rise without starting conflict. So shifts in the distribution of power alone is not a sufficient cause of conflict during a power transition. And we'll talk about this a bit later, I think, but one canonical case of this is the rise of the United States. So the United States rose to world power status at the turn of the 20th century, and we didn't have great power war with Britain. So that's an important case. Second, I argue that power transitions are principally a social phenomenon, not a material phenomenon. That is, they're about rising powers trying to establish great power identity. That means great powers want status, and I think that power transitions are importantly about a struggle for status. Establishing an identity, achieving status in the system, I argue, um, requires recognition, right? You can't be something without other actors recognizing you as it, right? You can't have status. The example I always use is, my parents might think I'm the greatest IR scholar in the world, right? But that doesn't matter because I need recognition from the people that matter, right, in order to have that status in the profession. The same thing with rising powers, right? They need recognition in order to live the kind of life in international affairs that they want to live. And for me, that's what power transitions are fundamentally about. They're trying to secure a place atop a social hierarchy in the international order, and they're trying to cope with the uncertainty that this process brings to them. So sort of base, most basically, my book offers a social theory of power transitions, which is a kind of direct contradiction, I should say, or challenge to the idea that these are really just about shifts in the material balance of power.